All right, hello everybody. I'm uh, at uh, NRAO working right now with the uh, North American Alma Science Center on Alma operations. And I'm giving this talk on behalf of the NGVLA operations, uh, Science Operations Working Group. There's a number of people in the audience today. We've got Joan Warble, we have Brian Butler, uh, we have Frank Schintzel and uh, Eric Murphy. So if you have other questions, you can talk to those people um, about that. We've done our first draft of our operations plan for internal review. And I'm gonna highlight very briefly um, some aspects of that. So overall, the science operations is, um, you know, it's based on our 45 years of experience supporting the radio millimeter community through uh, telescopes, hopefully you're all familiar with. And I list here what I think are the main key drivers from the NGVLA project that informed how we put together the operations plan. So it's a proposal driven point of general purpose uh, instrument primarily. Uh, we have been tasked with operating in a cost limited um, environment. So we have to have a lot of automation and we have to have good prioritization for what we spend our efforts on. Um, just like SKA, we're going to use concurrent subarrays to allow simultaneous scientific observations, multiple projects, as well as maintenance and testing, which so we hope won't be taking the telescope, the array offline uh, for any significant amount of time. We can do things in pieces. Um, observations are going to be dynamically scheduled by and large, except for ones that are you know, inherently time uh, critical or time bounded. Um, and so they'll be based on the appropriate conditions for that part of the array that you that your science requires. And then the fundamental products for standard observing modes, and I'll go into some differentiation for that, are going to be high level data products. Now high level data products will depend on what the, the PI's goals are and the observing mode. So for uh, for imaging, spectral line imaging, it would be a data, a deconvolved data cube. Um, but for a redshift survey, it, it could be just spectra. Um, and another key point is that this is going to, uh, the NGVLA will replace the VLA and VLBA. Um, there will be a transition plan. Joe Lazio has a poster, I think it's number 40 um, on that. So if you're interested in that, um, I direct you to that poster. Okay, so this um, graphic kind of um, demonstrates the, I guess I go this way because my microphone's over there, um, the aspects of science operations. So it's gonna be run out of a, a science and data center uh, that's gonna be located near a large metropolitan area. It could be Albuquerque is like a place, but it could be other places not decided yet. And this is, this is gonna be the base for science operations as well as the support staff, the software support, et cetera. The Science Center has as its um, responsibility to support users from proposing to publishing, as well as helping grow the scientific support, uh, the scientific community. The Data Center is responsible for the processing needs and producing the high-level data products, um, which you'll hear me say many times. So that's, in a, uh, that's illustrated in this swim diagram here. And in the next five slides, I'm going to uh, go into each one of these from proposal um, submission, um, observing, data processing, user support, and then telescope support. So starting out here with uh, the proposal um, time allocation, so it's an annual cycle uh, with intercycle opportunities through a director's discretionary time, as you heard from, like from SK. These are going to be peer reviewed and the PEIs, also like SK, is going to be awarded time not sensitivity. So that's like the VLA, like SKA, unlike ALMA. And so for sensitivity driven projects that will be translated using uh, the collection of antennas that are matched to the science goals to an equivalent number of antenna or baseline hours. And then it is, you, the project will be considered complete when you have reached that equivalent number of hours. So that means that we don't, um, we do quality assessment, not quality assurance. So we assess it, our calibration will be assured, and then the products at the end won't be compared to what your science goal was, but what you got with the time and the antennas that uh, were scheduled. Now the observing modes um, that we have, now this is not all the observing, there's other things like TOOs, et cetera, but we, um, this is in terms of 
um, what your expectations are when you write your proposal. We're going to say which modes are going to be standard, which are non-standard. Standard are going to be ones that can be automatically pipeline produced, automatically quality assessed, and they produce high-level data products. Non-standard modes are for ones that we have, um, we know the, the workflow, it's not fully automated in a pipeline, it's pipeline assisted, user assisted pipelines or proto pipelines, they will still be fully quality assessed and high level data products will be given. Uh, the shared risk, so these are things that we've done, this is different than AMA, where we want to get the community involved in the telescope in ways that was not possible with AMA. So shared risk are ones that are, these are commissioned, all these modes are commissioned, anything that's offered is gonna be commissioned. And so we, but we may not have the full uh, use cases. We may have done the whole breadth of observing use cases. So a shared risk observation will be less well characterized. The QA is less developed uh, and the data products might be simpler. Um, then there's new mode test observations, which will be a minority, but that's for a commission capability where there's a lot of interest in the community and there's expertise in the community that they want access to this data that will not be quality assessed. It will have a very simple quality assessment. Um, so this, is, this prevents us from having some new capability that has been delivered um, from engineering and AIV, and then you guys don't get to use it for several years. So we'd like to make those kind of things available here. We expect that in uh, full operations that the majority, vast majority, greater than at least 80% will be done through standard modes. Okay, and like um, SKA, we are going to be observing with concurrent subarrays. We have up to 10 concurrent subarrays that allows us to have several science projects going at a given time, um, as well as software testing can be done on a, a small collection of antennas for upgrades to the software. Maintenance can be done. That would be more like engineering testing would be, could be done at the same time. And so projects are going to be broken into two schedule blocks. I guess that's the equivalent of the SBDs. Um, and so these are the schedulable um, pieces of, of, of instruction based on the PI's science goals, the resolution, larger singular scale, possibly the imaging dynamic range. That group of SBs would then be analyzed as basically to decide which subarrays, what collection of antennas will be set up for a kind of a short term uh, schedule to decide which one goes on. But at the time of observation, you have to take into account what the actual condition. So you might say that we think we're gonna have these subarrays scheduled for the next coming days, weeks, but then at the time, the phase conditions may not be proper at the other time. So we can take those antennas, redeploy them in some other way, and then we pick the SBs that match those antennas. So that's the scheduling idea. Uh, scheduling will accommodate time sensitive observations, TOOs, um, observations with other observatories, coordinate observations. Otherwise than that, it will be scheduled dynamically based on the conditions uh, for the relevant array components. So just going a little bit into the subarrays. So as you know, from Monday's talk, there's this, we have these components, long baseline stations. There's 10 um, over here with baselines out to 9,000 kilometers about, um, 30 antennas and 10 stations. Then we have the mid um, that goes over three southwestern states in Mexico. Then on the plains of San Augustine, we have the spiral. And then down into the core, they have different number of antennas here. And the short baseline is, so those are all 18 meter uh, antennas. The short baseline is these 96 meter telescopes. And so subarrays can be um, built from any collection. We want to take the long baseline and throw in the ones at the end, end of the mid, or you may bring in some from the core. Core plus mid will be a popular one. Um, and so any combination will be, and those will be determined based on information collected during the proposal for what your science goals are. Uh, right. And they are going to, how we do it is we're going, we want to optimize operations throughput, operations flow. That's where the subarrays will go. So science ranking will definitely be a high weighting factor for that. But we want to make sure that we are efficiently using the telescope um, and getting as many projects completed as we can. OK, the next thing up here is the data processing and archiving. So the NGVLA uh, data processing is going to require a supercomputer rated facility. There's a memo here I reference at the bottom 
uh, which is Sanjay's memo on the size of computing. Uh, this is hundreds of thousands of GPU equipped nodes, 60 petaflops per second is the size of computing. That's a 20% overhead from what our production, what we think it takes to do a year's worth of um, data processing. Data volume is greater than 240 petabytes per year. Uh, it is not decided yet what our processing model will be, uh, whether it's going to be in-house, have a partners with a supercomputing facility, contract out with some cloud service, or some combination. I suspect we're going to end up with some combination where we have some um, key. Like a key part of the um, size of computing is that 90% of the, of the pr observing projects that were analyzed should be able to be done with a six petaflight flop system which is something that you might be able to have in-house. And then 10% require this 44 petaflop system. And then you get the 20% overhead for reprocessing and user-driven processing. And so you might have a 16 petaflop system in the science and data center, and then 44 that you use um, special purpose for the large projects. As I've said a couple of times now, the, standard pro the products for standard modes are pipeline produced high level data products. A uh, big activity this year is defining what we mean by high-level data products. It will depend on what the um, science goals are. It will be deconvolved image cubes for imaging projects. It could be spectra for redshift surveys. And so we will use the proposal metadata, that information we collect from PIs, to decide what those final products are. That's different from ALMA, where every spectral window is processed and archived and everything else. Given that computing is going to be a resource like observing time, we just can't process everything all the time. So we want to be smart about what we, what we do and um, produce the things that are most useful for getting science out. Automatically pipeline processed and quality assessed. And then we will archive the raw data and the calibration products and the science data products with some proprietary access. The, that's TBD, what that period is. Then from the science archive, there will be uh, these key capabilities. There's going to be advanced data exploration tools, um, in-situ visualization, so you can explore the data before deciding what you want to download or export. Um, you'll be able to download the calibrated data that will be generated on the fly or the, and or the products, including subsets, a subcube, just small little cutouts of sources of interest if you want. Um, or measurement sets, you may want to average uh, the data in some way to make it more manageable for you back at home. If you don't have the processing resources back at your uh, host institute, you'll have access to archive workspaces. So the data will be taken from the archive, put onto some facilities at the data center, and where you can um, do your own uh, user-driven processing there. We have already NROs doing this with their Audi um, Alma user-driven um, systems. And so this will obviate the need for you to download these huge, you know, 109 terabyte thing to do at home. Now, in the small print here, I don't know if you can see it, this is the caveat. Again, since this is going to be a limited resource, um, there is chance that we will have to make this available on a competitive basis. And you won't be able to have processing all the time. You have to go into a queue and have it may even have to be prioritized for the big projects. The ones that have to go back to the 44 petaflop system, that might require an extra data processing proposal that would be scientifically assessed. OK, now we're moving over here to the support of science and outreach. So support is, this is helping you with your observations from all aspects, from proposing, observing, data processing, et cetera. So it's the standard stuff, online documentation, help desks, knowledge base. We'll have one-on-one -on -one opportunities either remote sessions with a, a support staff or in-person visits, as, as NREO is always um, supported. There'll be project contact scientists to help you uh, with your accepted proposals. We plan to have access to science platforms. Uh, these are common environments for data exploration. These are, have, you'd have notebooks. You'd have uh, versions of CASA, or NG CASA installed. You'd have other an analysis. Um, areas that you and your collaborators from around the world could log into and um, explore and uh, get your papers written. And we'll expand the NREO support program, such as page, page charges. Now, for outreach, that's growing the user community um, and just leading to the overall um, education of 
of the next generation of observers, so training workshops, community days, the ambassador program that we've run for a long time um, with Alma and, and VLA. Uh, there'll be self-training documentation, notebooks and such, science meeting support, and expansion of the NRIO um, student pre-doc pre and sabbatical programs. Okay, that's as one, that's as four, okay. Um, so another important aspect is the science support of the other parts of the observatory, so the telescope, um, so that's problem investigation. Software science support is getting, is we're gonna embed scientists with the software development teams in an agile sense so that there is a continuous rollout of capabilities with science and validation being done in concert um, together. Um, and then we will support development program. So I'm gonna quickly go on to that because I have two slides on that. Um, so there will be a, a um, continuously maintained development roadmap to continuously update the vision for the scientific enhancement of the NGVLA. This is gonna be developed in concert with the Science Advisory Committee. And so it will consider all these components from um, observing capabilities enhancements, enhancements that's new observing modes or making a non-standard mode standard. Um, capability enhancements is to make our operations make us more efficient, improve our QA, uh, make it so we can do more with less. And then we'll we plan to have a funded development program that uh, will be supported competitively. Um, the target is around 9% of the operations budget. That includes development studies. The studies and the development projects are similar to the ALMA program for those, so you can read uh, the, the definitions of them. Um, projects will be clearly defined efforts for unique projects. This could be new bands or new um, capabilities. And then there's a legacy science program, um, which is not something that's done. So this is a funded proposal that would be solicited outside the call for proposals. Um, I think the number is around three to four million dollars a year is what we're, we'd like to fund this at. One to three awards every other year starting, so starting in full science, that means we're not going to be doing this in the early science operations. It's run outside the regular call and the main point is that it should, it should provide the community new, significantly new capabilities, something that can't be done by just putting a couple of observing proposals together. And these products would be delivered back to the observatory, ingested, and then they have no proprietary period. And if you have more than that, there's a uh, paper here from Eric Murphy that describes that program. Okay, this is my last slide. And this is a packed lot in here. <laughs> And this is a concept of how we roll out. So year one, year two, I, I put a year on that. I really don't think we can go into that. Um, so, const that's, so construction starts in year one and construction goes here. Here's how the antennas um, grow. And so the idea, I haven't mentioned, this is its own slide. So there's a first look science. That's like science verification that um, um, you just heard about for SKA. So we'll have notice of intents. And then when we have a VLA worth of collecting area, we plan to conduct it. This is observatory conducted based on recommendations from the community from notices of intent. We will select some, we will process them, and then we'll put them out there so the community can see what the early NGVLA is capable of. And during this time, we are developing pipelines here. And this is the time where we are commissioning the first standard mode pipelines in this period. And then here's the call for proposals. And during that time, we hope to have, you know, some, some of these offered each time, the idea is that the standard modes, we, we may only have a few standard modes available in the early years, but each cycle, the number of standard modes would increase. And by the end of the construction project, we have this 80% standard mode and then some smattering of these other ones. So um, that's it. I've got a minute left, so I'll take questions at this time. Again, we've got time for one quick question. So, um, as we all know, the NGVLA and all past uh, uh, NREO observatories have been open skies, which is very laudable. Um, but I'm just wondering about the post-processing facilities and, and all of that stuff, which is additional to just getting observing time on the telescope. Yeah. Will all of those things in the facilities you talked about also be open skies based on scientific merit and that sort of thing? So far, yes. So not just to US-based astronomers? So right now we, we don't have partners. We are US-based 
but it will be open skies. That's the NSF policy. Um, th there might be arrangements with, you know, Naval Observatory or something for some aspect, but those right now, the idea is that the vast majority is going to be proposal driven scientific merit. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, great. Let's thank John again. Yeah. Uh, so the next talk.